we're going to be get down to cases. Here, you notice Moroni takes up the story. He picks up the, father, the record at his father's command. He takes over the record at this time. And here's a sad picture. This, ha this has all happened after Camorra. It's all over now. And Moroni has been running for about 15 years. Long after, this is in the 400s, you see. About 400, 401. So this is 15 years after Camorra. He writes, he writes the rest of Mormon's book. He's had plenty of time to think it over. We can understand that. The Nephites escaped southward, were hunted by the Lamanites. Everything is in confusion. And uh, his father has been killed and slain, and the rest of them. I alone remain to write, write the sad tale of the destruction of my people. They're all gone. Well, here you think, this is an epic theme, isn't it? The last survivor, the ring of the nibble, the, the, the last survivor, Richard. When, when great armies break up and shatter, you'll find last survivors moving around in the country, they, disguising themselves in various ways, managing to, to carry on. But the last survivor is a real figure, and he's a tragic figure. The lay of the last minstrel, uh, Scott's work, in this particular subject, the la there's the last one. There's many a last, it's very interesting in the, in the current National Geographic, uh, the cover story is devoted to the last photographs of the last time we're ever going to see a dozen or so different well-known, rather exotic animals which are disappearing from the earth. And these photographs represent the last time they'll be seen. So, talk about extermination, he's the last of Nephites. You said, well, you know the last of the Mohicans, you uh, read Cooper, the sad passing tribes have passed away and there have been a last man. Dolly Pentreath was the last woman to speak Cornish and the uh, philologist used to be get, beat a trail to her door. Yes, there are such things as the last people and the last survivor, and uh, Moroni was one of them, and of course it's, it's infinitely sad. This shows that survive is a dirty word. We like the word survive, and it's a dirty word. Uh, it means to live after everybody else is dead. Survivor, supervivir, to live after everybody else is dead. You want to be the lucky one. When uh, it's uh, J John Chrysostom, the, great, uh, the most eloquent orator, perhaps of the late 4th and early 5th century in the Christian church, St. John Chrysostom. He says in, the, in Antioch, when he was there, before the great earthquake, everybody was running around saying, I wish there'd be a big earthquake, kill everybody in Antioch but me, then I'd be the richest man in Antioch. And that's the way everybody felt about it. See, I want to survive, I'll be the richest man then when that happens. Well, Antioch was destroyed, and there were very few survivors indeed. It was one of the most total earthquakes in the world ever recorded. Well, but notice, could anything be sadder than this, you see? Well, remember the, the refrain in Job, and I alone remain to tell thee, I alone have come to tell thee, the message of the, the only survivor of Job's house comes to tell him. Or the ancient mariner. There was an ancient mariner, he haunted one of three, he tells this, this grim story. <coughs> And uh, it's very sad, you know, the, the lone survivor story. It, you can make quite a list of them. The point is that they're real. And how many are we going to have now? Who wants to be the lone survivor? Let's hold up here. Well, Mo Moby Dick, the same thing. See, that's the very same thing. Uh, he's the lone survivor. After all, who's writing the story? He starts out, call me if, you know. He's the lone survivor, a wanderer in the earth, one who's all alone and so forth. It's, it's a sad situation, but they are all gone. The instruction of my people. I fulfill the commandment of my father, whether they slay him or not, I, I know not, infinitely foreknown. But are not all ruins so? <coughs> well, this is what happened. I'm alone, he says in the next verse. I have not friends nor whither to go. Uh, I say, is, is this survival you look forward to? The Lamanites have hunted my people from city to city and place to place. They've all gone, but it hasn't settled anything. Notice, a military solution is no solution. It certainly isn't here. You may, may have heard Mr. Fallows yesterday talking about that. Who won the Cold War? Was well, the Japanese won the Cold War? <laughs> it, it's going to cost us our, our boots. But here, the Lamanites have hunted them down. He says, "It is the hand of the Lord which has done it." And also, see, you count on war for your victory and your success. And uh, and we won. Uh, both the Germans and the Japanese were knocked out, <laughs> and they're the ones that won the Cold War because we immediately. Instantly after, well, we already began the Cold War, but before the last one was over, we were planning to, to march against the Russians. That was our big idea the whole time along, we'll get into that. But see what it cost us now. So foolish. 
The hand of the Lord hath done it. Let that be assuring, an assurance to you. The hand of the Lord has done it. He's, what's going to happen, we're going to see it. And if it happens to us, it will be so. But the, did this settle the Lamanite problem after all? The Lamanites are at war with one another. The whole face of the land is one continual round of murder and bloodshed, and no one knoweth the end of the war. How long did it go on? For centuries. It never settled down at all. Tribal wars from then on. Well, this is the condition of the world. That's why it's going to launch... Moroni is going to launch into the story of the Jaredites next, which is even more, more tragic, even more horrendous, but in a different setting, a totally different culture. Take us way out of things. And there's nothing left but Lamanites and robbers. You notice the robbers are, are important here. Uh, the looters, the outlaws, the place full of them, swarming with them. When, when things break up like that, you're not going to stay around and be drafted for anything or anything like that. The pickings are rich. Uh, Look at Central America now. There have been these wandering bands of terrorists and who's a hero and who isn't and so forth. It gets hopelessly mixed up in, in every one of those republics. Go, you don't settle it by going in and blasting people that way. And uh, we have produced much the same result in parts of the world which we mean, mean to settle by force. Won't work. The, uh, I say the Lamanites and robbers, yes. And notice again, here we have that little group, the disciples of Jesus. They've always been there. They've always been there, discreet from the rest. He says they weren't involved. None that know the true God except the disciples of Jesus who tarry in the land. Until the wickedness, notice he's using the present tense here, who tarry. He doesn't know whether they're gone or not. But they tarry in the land until the wickedness of the people is so great that the Lord would not suffer them to remain with the people. Whether they're on the face of the land or not, I don't know, he says. The seven. That refers... To the three Nephites, of course, they, they belonged to that same group. But, of course, they were, they, they were of another nature from ours. They, they talked about that. We're going to have, have more talk about the three Nephites. He, he doesn't know what they are, what condition they're in, or anything else. He says, but, but here he's talking about those disciples. There's some of them. But Zion is fled. You have to grant that. The Lord wouldn't suffer them to remain here. The prophets mourned and withdrew. We're told that that's an eloquent term in the book of... In, in the book of the Sethians, the same thing. The principle is, remember, it starts out in the Book of Mormon, he leadeth the righteous away into precious lands. If they can't get along, uh, if there's no hope for reforming the rest of the world, you just take them out. Hence went forth the saying, Zion is fled, and is taken away. The man who walked with God and was not for God took him, and so forth. Uh, and... This is why the world today knows so little about Zion. Every time Zion gets really built up, it's taken away. Not there anymore. So then, he asks us to receive this record with an open mind, and that's what people don't do. They condemn it instantly. All they have to do is hear the word angel and gold plates, and you've already, the issue is settled. There's no further discussion necessary. Uh, and so nobody reads the Book of Mormon. Those, those who criticize it, because you don't have to go any further than that. It would be a waste of time talking about angels and things like that. Even the great Edward Meyer, who was absolutely electrified by the world, who couldn't leave Joseph Smith alone, decided it was the greatest thing that was, would not read the Book of Mormon. Thought of various excuses, it was written in crude English and all this sort of thing. But uh, once he said, uh, when, the minute he said the word angel, that's a hallucination, that settles it. Forgetting that the Book of Mormon is not a hallucination. Well, we'll come to that in a minute. Well, I'm the one who's hiding the record. I'm, I'm uh, making an end of speaking concerning this people. So, so, much for the, so much for the Nephites then. I'm the same who hideth it up. Now I'm going to talk to you, he says. And that's, that, of course, is why I'm doing it. That's why, he's been, why we've been spared. And the plates, no one shall have them to get gain. If we only, if we only had the plates, it would be, cause a terrible lot of mischief, wouldn't it? All the argument about the translating them and this, that, and the other. Nobody would know anything about it best thing is not to have them. We have something far better than we have them. The inspired translation, and this can be tested. This we can test it, so. And now these marvelous passages of how the Book of Mormon will become forth again under what conditions traces us right down to our time. The wondrous, haunting refrain, it shall come forth in a day, it shall come forth in a day. Uh, and then, shall be brought out of darkness unto light. See, these are the old hermetic themes. Out of darkness unto light, according to the word of God, to shine forth out of the darkness. If their faults, they are the faults of men. To behold, we know no fault. Nevertheless, God knoweth all things. And this is the final lesson of the Book of Mormon. The same that judges rashly shall be judged rashly. Again, he's talking about the people to come, you see. Don't judge this book. But of course, this is a nice commentary on his own people who have just been destroyed. 
the same who judge rashly shall be judged rashly again. This is the, for according to the works shall his wages be therefore, he that smiteth shall be smitten again, saith the Lord. Behold, the scripture saith, this is there any lesson in the Book of Mormon to us, and this is it, of course. Man shall not smite, neither shall he judge. We tell other people what to do, we lay down our moral rights, we go out and police them and so forth, and we back it up with physical force. Is there anything more futile than that? Now, brother. <laughs> well, of course, this is all the trouble this raises with the Bible. What are you going to do? Different translations of the Bible keep coming out. Now, I'll, I'll read differently. This is supposed to be a perfect good book. Every, every uh, word in the book is absolutely perfect. We have to admit that because if we say, if we say there are imperfections in the Bible, how do we know which verses are imperfect and which aren't? How do we know whether we're on the right track? It means we can't use the Bible itself as an absolute guide because there if we acknowledge mistakes in it, and that's fatal, so the Christian world can't afford to admit that. But we can afford to admit it. Of course there are mistakes in the Bible, they, they admit it too. The latest revised standard translation comes out of the Protestants. What are they doing revising this perfect word of God? What are they being a new standard translation? We, there will be more in another 10 years or so, a brand new standard translation. So we have to admit the, the faults of men in there, that's necessary, and we admit it freely. All sorts of things explained that way. If you don't do that, you're stuck, you see. You're absolutely stuck with this, with one document. What kind of errors could one eye have meant here? Oh, all kinds of errors could come in. Uh, remember when he's talking about the chronology? Now, we think, when a Mormon says we think this is correct because the man who gave us the chronology was an honest man, but anybody can make mistakes, and so he says you just have to accept it that way. See? We're, we're not perfect in what we report here. So don't judge this, but... Man shall not smite, neither shall he judge. The two things were best at, you see. And, of course, this is Roman law. Uh, rerum dominus, uh, the end of, uh, of uh, Virgil's Ode there. We're the people who make the laws and who impose the laws. We crack down them. Uh, again, Temple uh, again, uh, the people of the Toga who've laid down the laws to the world. Um, oh, think of it. But, the eternal purposes of the, war of the Lord shall roll on. Anyway, whatever happens here. And those saints who have gone before me shall cry from the dust. The Lord will remember their covenant. See, we all have the same community. The thing to remember all the way through this that keeps coming back all the time is Moroni. He really came. He talked to Joseph Smith. He came to him many times. He conversed with each other. He did the same thing with Zechariah. If that's so, that changes the whole picture, doesn't it? That's what we're talking about. These people are all still there. They're all still alive. They're still very much concerned with us and so on. We're still in the same community. We're going to have to join together with them to live together for a long time, a little later on. That doesn't sound too fantastic. We'll see more of that in the Book of Mormon now, too. Uh, these things they could do. Uh, they could, uh, in his name, they could remove mountains. They could cause the earth to shake and so forth. As I said before, Miracles are always a matter of timing, you see. The Lord will tell you when it's going to shake, and then it shakes as far as that goes. You, know, you make it. Uh, by, but the point is, in his names, and at his word, he would give them a signal, and uh, the miracle would take place duly on that. Their prayers also in behalf of him that the Lord should suffer to bring forth these things, referring to the prophet Joseph and the unknown to them at this time and what he would have to go through. It wasn't going to be easy. And these are the conditions in the time of Joseph Smith, and they follow right down to the present. And uh, they terminate here in the, in the 27th verse. Well, here we go. Out of the earth shall they come by the hand of the Lord, and it shall come in a day. Here's the refrain, see, this awesome refrain. It shall come in a day when it shall be said that miracles are done away with. And of course, that's why they rejected the Book of Mormon. Such things can't happen. We said angels and gold plates. That's utter absurdity. So that's the first, rejected on the first grounds at all. The miracles don't happen. That is, things were not familiar. The miraculum is a little thing that makes you wonder because you don't understand it, that's all. And they say they are done away and it shall come in as if one should speak from the dead. As if one should speak from them. But it is a voice from the dust. It does speak from the dead. It shall come in the day when the blood of the saints shall cry unto the Lord because of secret combinations and works of darkness. The... Uh, the things that have been done here, of course, it's all secret. I was talking to the phony, he talked for quite a long time last night, 
man who's been very successful in business, he's in California now. He says, it's all secret. The secret is to pull surprises on everybody can do it. Don't let them know what you're doing. Well, that's exactly what Aristotle and Rasa said, who was the richest man of his time. You know, they said, uh, what is the secret of getting riches? That's it, it's secrecy. Don't let people know what you're doing. It's secret combinations. That's the essence of, of, uh, of uh, stock trading and things like that, you see. The, uh, again, there was a, another case I heard yesterday. He told me a case of one man who made a lot of money in a hurry because of insider trading. And, you know, it, was a, it was an eminent member of the church. <coughs> but these sort of things happen all the time. Secret combinations and works of darkness shall come in a day when the power of God shall be denied and the churches become defiled and lifted up in their hearts, even in a day when the leaders of the churches shall rise up, the pride of their hearts, into the envying of them who belong to the church. Now, what is the envy? Is that a subjective, en a subjective participle or an objective participle? The envying of the people. Is he, they're envying him or he envying them? They envy him. Eh? He doesn't envy them. They envy him, his success and wealth. Probably that's what, what it may be. But they, uh, they tell you here, uh, but whether it's, uh, this is a famous crooks in Arabic, always arguing whether a, a, a genitive like this is, a, is subjective, a participle is subjective or objective. What are we on to here now? The, uh, when there shall be filled, well, we don't need to comment on these things, these things. Well, what's wrong with vapors of smoke? They can't hurt anybody, a little smoke in the air. Ah, we know this means something different today, doesn't it? So come a day, the 29th verse, when there shall be heard of fires, tempests, and vapors of smoke in forest la foreign land. It tells us elsewhere in the Book of Mormon, the vapor of smoke, and it shall cover the earth. That could only be the outfall from something or other, couldn't it? There should be also heard of wars and rumors of wars. There are 47 wars raging at present in the earth. And earthquakes in dire places. We're now going into a period of, of increased earthquake activity recorded in places. It hasn't happened for a long time. Uh, and they're expecting the big one, of course, on the Wasatch Front. Uh, they're insensitive, unperturbed. All sense of fair play is forgotten here in, in this me generation. Notice this 31st verse. Come in a day when there shall be pollutions upon the face of the earth. Well, that's the number one problem today is pollution. It's not just pollution, you see, uh, impurities and things like that, but pollutions on the face of the earth. The earth itself is being defiled. The face of the earth, not just in the church or something like that. These are the pollutions we're dealing with today on the face of the earth. And needless to say, there should be murders and robbing and lying and deceivings and whoredoms, all manner of abominations. And there should be many who will say, again, our lowering of standards, our very permissive society here, the, uh, we accept our lower standards. Do this or do that, it mattereth not. The Lord will uphold such as the last day, but woe unto such, for they are in the gall of bitterness and bonds of iniquity. They're going to say it's all right, you see, because you'll be justified. It will come in a day when the churches shall say, Come unto me for your money, and you shall be forgiven your sins. Just the other night I heard an evangelist say that you give money, give money, give money, and Jesus will accept you. <laughs> he will accept you if you give money. That's exactly what it says here. Come unto me, and for your money, you'll be forgiven your sins. But who are you giving the money to? Is he to him? The person who says, Come unto me, he doesn't say, Come unto Jesus. He says, Jesus, that's what the call is, of course, but you send the money to me. You come to Jesus, but you send the money to me. Uh, O ye wicked and perverse, stiff-necked people, why do you build up churches unto yourselves to get gain and adjust the scriptures to allow for that sort of thing, you know? Why have you transfigured the holy work of God that you might bring damnation to your souls? And of course, the, the misreading of the scriptures is deliberately transferred. The scriptures are before you, the Book of Mormon says. You rest them at your peril. So we've transfigured the holy word of God that you might bring damnation on your souls. Behold, look at the, at the uh, revelations of God, for behold, the time is come when these things must be fulfilled. Well, at the time the Book of Mormon comes forth. For that, you see. Notice it says here, The Lord hath shown me great and marvelous things concerning that which must shortly come at that day, which must shortly come, they will soon follow the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, may shortly come at that day, when these things shall come forth among you. The, um, it's, it's not very long. Uh, dating it by sequence now. We follow certain sequences here. Behold, I speak unto you. Now here is a ringing verse. I speak unto you as if you were present, and yet you are not. But behold, Jesus Christ has shown you unto me, and I know your doing. I know you walk in the pride of your hearts, and are none save a few only that do 
lift, do not lift themselves up in the pride of their hearts. Unto what? The wearing of very fine apparel. And envyings is envy, competitiveness, a competitiveness. See, this is, I think that talk that Mr. Fallows gave yesterday was very pertinent to what we're reading here. Envyings and strifes and malice and persecutions, a highly competitive society. All manner of iniquities in your churches, every one have become polluted because of the pride of your hearts. And then it comes down with the, the, the payoff sentence here that says, For behold, ye do love money. And your substance, which is the same, and your fine apparel, and the adornment of your churches. These are not pagans. Notice he starts the next verse by saying, I talk to the unbelievers in the next, the next chapter. I'm talking to people who profess to believe on Christ. Your churches more than you love the poor, the sick, the needy, and the afflicted. That's an understatement, you see. You polluters. Well, I have promised and threatened at times. I never have used Roman satire, but uh, here it's worth it. I think we should mention, though, read you just from one sat satire of Juvenal describing Roman society. Now, Juvenal lived in the middle of the, of the first century after Christ when the empire was at its height, and yet it had a, a line of corrupt emperors. He lived uh, beginning with uh, Nero, the, uh, and then Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, and Otho, they were all pigs. Vitellius was a huge, enormous fat man. He was fabulously rich. He bought the empire. But uh, then Galba and Otho came before him, and then came the, uh, the family of Vespasian, uh, who was pretty good, and, uh, and his son, Vespasian and his son Titus. And then back again to Domitian, a terrible emperor. Uh, and the rich and lavish ways of life. But uh, the very time it reached its peak, it was already on its way out, the empire was. It was, very, uh, it was the peak of the Roman Empire, its greatest extent. Uh, and it was already finished. And he knows it already. It's only later in life, it's only after he's 50 years old that he's willing to write this way. And uh, he says, you might as well enjoy it. Rome produced only one, the great civilization, Rome produced only one genre of literature, but it's a great one. It's satire. Perseus, Juvenal, the best of all, I think, is Petronius, Horace, and here, Marshall, and here we have, uh, we're going to give some Juvenal. But these, uh, all, because they said, what can you do? His first satire is, what can you do but write satire when you see the things that are going on today? It's just too ridiculous for words. It makes no sense at all, but we go right on with it. And that's one we thing we sorely miss. We're very sensitive, we're very touchy on the, on the subject of satire today. People get too satirical, it makes us nervous. There are plenty to satirize in our society, as you know. Oh boy, is there. But uh, we're being very careful not to rock the boat too much. But we're going to take one satire here. This is the 14th. They all talk about the same thing, but uh, trust these are the 14th. This is one here. We're going to talk about on education for avarice, it's called. Oh, I'm going to use this translation here. I was going to, oh, it, it would slow me up too much if I would give you my own rendition, so I left my doing at home. <laughs> Does Rutilius teach us how to show a merciful disposition, charity toward his slight faults, having made his immense fortune? Does he think, we just mentioned this, your substance more than you do the poor, the needy, and the sick and the afflicted. He thinks other people don't even have souls at all, he says. Does he think that body and spirit are made of the self-same stuff in the case of slaves and freedmen? Or does he teach us to rage, to rejoice as he does in cruel sound of the whip, music more sweet to him than the sirens? Efficiency, it gets things done. The tyrant of giant size he is to his trembling household, happy only at times when he summons the torture. It's a terrible way to run a household. But I know some big ranchers that run their establishments about on this in this manner. Torture, branding, some poor slaves, that was years ago, uh, some poor slaves with hot iron for snitching a couple of towels. What is a young man taught by a sire who delights in the clanking of iron chains and branding slaves and dungeons? He goes on. Are you greenhorn enough to suppose that the daughter of Larga won't grow up to be promiscuous when it took her 30 deep breaths as a child to get through the list of the lovers known to sleep with her mother? <laughs> Even when she was a virgin, Mama would not would tell her all. And now, at Mama's dictation, she fills little wax tablets and sends them off to her lover. This is the morality of the time when everybody was sleeping with everybody else. Such is the order of nature. Evil examples at home corrupt us all more quickly, since they subvert our minds with the sanction of loftier warrant, more important people do it. And so, for the rest, they are led in evil paths of their fathers, dragged in the wheel ruts of guilt, shown them over and over, the same things done. The uh, other ones here. Okay. Quitonius likes to build new houses, property mad. 
now on the Bay of State, and now on Tivoli, remember the nine or so estates and castles that, uh, that the late uh, Malcolm Forbes had. Now on Tivoli's heights, now on Prinesta, his mansions rise with marble brought from Greece or lands beyond the ocean. I think of, uh, of course, of uh, William Randolph Hearst. Overtopping the shrines of fortune or Hercules, even more than Poseidon, was Posides the eunuch surpassed our capital. Now here's a eunuch who, with a little swindling, had got himself very rich, and he built a house more magnificent than the capital. While Cretonius lived in houses like these, he diminished much of his fortune. He spent his wealth, but hung it into a portion not by any means small. But his son, a madman, destroyed it, wearing still newer houses, and they do that sort of thing. But they're stingy at the same you know, time. Young men not, ought not to be taught to imitate most of the vices. They, we admire the frugality of these very rich men. Only avarice seems to oppose their natural instinct. Here is a vice for once, the shape and shade of a virtue, gloomy of mien, dour in, in dress and expression, very important man, you see. The miserly man is praised, of course, as if he were frugal, a saving soul, to be sure, craftier keeper of fortunes than dungeons of Pontus or the Hesperidian gardens, where wealth is safer, you see. Add the fact that the people, think so that the people think of the man whom I mentioned as an artist in games. They admire him. We may name some of those people. Estates increase with such forgemen. As they increase in every way, they become bigger and bigger. The anvil is never still, and the furnace is forever blazing. And remember what Fallow said yesterday. We have just one measure by which we measure success, progress, and what is desirable under our version of capitalism. He's comparing with the Japanese. What was it? More. If it makes more, that's the only test. More of this, more of that. That's what it has to be. Is that the wisest? Always to ask more. And Juvenal asked that here, of course. Estates crease with such forged men. They increase every way, becoming bigger and bigger. The anvil is never still. So when a father thinks that the avaricious are happy, that the very rich are fortunate, and he looks open-mouthed at wealth, gaping with admiration, you see, and figures no poor man is blessed, he is urging young men to follow along that highway to study the same school he did, to get his MBA, as he, as he says it here. There are the ABCs of vices. These he indoctrinates first, compelling his pupils to master the meanest, pettiest things, but before long, Two, he instructs them in the insatiable hopes and passions for acquisition, whatever you do, get rich. He couldn't, and, and uh, I can testify this because some of my kids have worked for them, LDS employers are notoriously stingy and mean to their help. You may have found that out. While he is starving himself, well, he cramps the guts of his slaves with the shortest, most meager of rations. While he is starving himself, for he cannot possibly manage to eat up the pieces of bread and the moldy blue-colored remnants and so on. But why accumulate riches through such tortures as these, when it seems the most obvious madness, living the life of a tramp to be a rich man on your deathbed? Meanwhile, the money bag swells, grows fat, and in just that proportion, the love of money bloats up. And he who has only a little covets at least. As for you, a single house in the country does not suffice at all. You'll have to purchase another. Now, this is uh, the developer he's talking about now. You have to extend your acres because the neighbor, neighbor's cornfield seems both bigger and better, so you buy it up. And the woodland, also the slope of the hill, thick with the green grain olive. But what if you can't get it, he says. Now, this is developer's tactics he's talking about here. If the owner declines to sell under any conditions, you can send, it over, you can send over by night lean oxen, famished cattle into the green fields, Tired though they are, they will never find their way home till they've stored the whole crop in their ravenous bellies. They've eaten up the, everything on the land, you see, so the guy has to sell it now. So that you, so that you might well believe it, was mown by close crop sickles. You could hardly say how many are bewailing wrongs like these, how many fields are sold by such tactics. Various ways of moving in and taking over a tract of land the person doesn't want to sell, or ways of making it valueless and so forth. Well, these are tricks, remember, this 2,000 years ago, they went to all and this, how long did it take them to collapse? Well, it was almost overnight when it comes. Hence comes the cause of crime. There is no greater incentive toward the compounding of poison, and we'll see what's behind crime, as you, as you, if you didn't know from our prime time TV, toward compounding of poisons or thickening blows with a dagger than the desire of wealth beyond all moderate means. To get rich, to get rich quick. But how can a desperate miser hustling for all he's worth ever expect to develop fear or respect for law or a decent sense of proportion? Live content, my sons, with your hills and your little cabins, he says here. And the costly apparel. A man who is not ashamed to wear hip boots when it's icy, turning away the cold with reversible furs. You will never find him wanting to do actions he knows are forbidden. Here's an honest man who dressed in, in practical clothes, nothing else. But, he says, it's the purple garb, the, the costly 
fashionable foreign styles, the raiment peculiar and foreign, whatever it may be that leads to wicked behavior. See, the Book of Mormon always ties up costly apparel with this uh, sort of thing. At autumn's end, after, now, you got to get an education to get rich. This is not, to get, to get, you can't get rich unless you do. So he says, at autumn's end, the father at midnight, that's at autumn's end, where the school begins again, you see. At midnight awakens the son who's asleep on his back and yells at him, wake up, get going, pick up your tablets and write, read up on your cases, study the red letter laws of the past. They're studying just business and law. It's the only thing they were studying this time. I had a long article I threatened I would read, but I won't on this subject in, in the ancient world. The red letter days of the past or seek the centurion's office. Try to find something to sell for profit. It's say it 50%. Don't turn up your nose at business that has to be banished to the far side of the Tiber because it's indecent, all sorts of things. And don't make any distinction between the odors of hides and the attar of roses. A prophet is a prophet, and it always smells good, no matter what possible source it may come from. Here's a slogan for you, a, a maxim worthy of poets. Even if Jove himself turned barred, this would be the supreme teaching of all time, he says, and this is put in italics here. No one asks where you get it, but money is what you must have. No, we didn't worry about it, but you have to. No, we hear this all the time. Kivis, kivis, rem. They're the same words used, used exactly by, by Horace. He laughs at kivis, kivis, rem. Honestus hypotes, me, honesto, inonesto. Get money. Honestly, if you can, but honestly or dishonestly, get money. You have to. Well, we're told that. Be, become independent and all this sort of thing. These are the lessons for toddlers. Taught them before they can walk by dried up, haggard old nursemaids. This the girls all learn before their alpha and beta. If a father insists on imparting such admonitions, I would speak to him thus. Tell me, you silly old codger, who is giving the orders to hurry so fast? I would bet you the pupil, the master, the teacher. Give up, go away, take it easy. Remember, he's going to buy you out, as the play is saying here. You will be beaten as surely as Telwin was by his, ad, uh, his Ajax. When he begins to submit at length his beard to the razor when he grows old enough to shave, you see. He'll be, then he'll practice and get rich the way you do. He'll be a false witness, he'll be a perjured peddler, he'll be a cheat one, he'll be a salesman who tries any trick on earth, you see. <laughs> and then come by the sh Things you think should accrue by land and sea, he will figure, come by, his, by a shorter road than that, not the hard way. A great crime is no trouble, and of course this is the theme of the crime shows, crime shows, crime shows we have all the time. See. A great, uh, come his way by a shorter road. A great crime is no trouble. I never taught him those ways. I never gave him such precepts, you say, you see. Maybe not in words, but you are the source and the fountain of evil intent. For the father who teaches love of great wealth and inspires greed in his sons by the warnings given in sinister ways, who shows him how he can double his patrimony by fraud, gives him a license, free reign, absolute control. If you call him back, you won't stop him. Once he's underway, he'll laugh at you in derision as he rushes headlong to the point of return far behind, that's 80, you see, this follows. No one believes it's enough to be partial delinquent, make it all the way. So far, no farther, there's no such teaching. So far, no farther. Oh no, they give themselves license much greater. And I say that's, that's the main theme that Mr. Fallows made yesterday. More, 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 no matter how much you have to get more, you're not being really successful. And so, when you tell a young man he's a fool to give a friend presents, to give anything away, <coughs> to help a relation in trouble, to lighten his poverty's burden, you teach him to rob and to swindle, to use any criminal method that will get him rich. Your own devotion to money is as great as the DCI I had for their country, so for their, their notorious uh, patriotism. If you will only watch, and he t here he talks about the theater and the shows. This is the theme of the shows, and we, we have it to say. See, theatromania became the big thing. The spectator sports, everything was spectators. Everybody went to the shows all the time. Uh, six, five and six days a week, everybody was at the, was at the shows and the games. And uh, they were divided between shows, games, athletics, all sorts of spectacles. They mixed them together. If you will only watch at what peril to life possessions of men's fortunes increase in the drama, he says, or the treasure grows in the strong box, it's there's a great danger there, you see. Since, or more and more, the coins are banked in the temple of Castor. Since that day, see, the banks were temples, so the money would be sacred. It's the only place where it was sacred. And you notice our banks are made like temples. They're made with marble and bronze and solemn columns uh, following the designs of, uh, like the stock market in New York, built after the designs of ancient temples, the Greek, Greek and Roman fanes, because they're, they're sacred. There is a reverential hush in there, and uh, everybody moves with awe because there's money, and there's the big vault back there. The vault represents the shrine where the god is, and only, only the high priest can go in there. It's a sacred place. And that's where you keep your treasure. If you treasure there, nobody will lay a finger on it. No, our banks are designed on that pattern. Very consciously, architects are quite aware of that. And so, 
Ever since the day when Mars the Avenger was robbed of his hay, his helmet unable to guard his own goods, it will do no harm to abandon the stage effects and the shows of Sibylle, Flora, and Ceres. Humans comings and goings are really much more amusing. Yes, here then. No, one madness pursues all men. We think of Orestes and Electra's arms facing the fire of the Furies and so forth. And he's talking about the, the extents to which people will go and the risks they will take to, to make money. He loads his ship to the gunner uh, and uh, cast off a... Well, it, this reminds you of the Valdes. He t talked about a man who has a, a super uh, freighter. He's built these enormous freighters. They, built that. they, were, they were huge, but they weren't, very, they weren't very sound. You can see why they were cheaper to build. They saved money that way. And he says, so, uh, one plank, there's between one plank and him in the deep, and the cause of his hardship, the reason for his risk, is silver cut into cartwheels, little ones, stamped with minute mottos, miniature portraits of coins, money, you see, numerous. Uh, Clouds and lightning come up. Cast off, cries the owner. Don't pay any attention to that. We have to make this shipment. Pepper and wheat fill the holes. There's nothing really the color of the sky, that bundle of black. Forget it. Summer lightning and thunder. Nothing at all but what happens when the ship is hit, you see. But this very night, the poor fellow, again, I think of the Valdez Exxon here. By this very night, the poor fellow runs a good chance to be flung overboard as the timbers are broken. Overwhelmed by the way, but hanging on to his wallet with his teeth or his left hand. Yesterday, not all the gold or Tagus carries along with the red-colored sands of Pactolus, famous gold regions, <laughs> would have sated his need. But today he's lucky in having rags to cover him and a crust of bread. He's a beggar, painting pictures of a storm and a shipwrecked pleader for pennies. Property won by such ills is kept with fear and with trouble. Even greater still is the wretched to guard the huge fortune. Plutocrat that he is, Licinius, has to order a quarter, a cohort of his slave boys to stand on guard all night with fire buckets, ready at hand. He fears for his amber, his statues, his marble, bought from Phrygian shores, his ivory tortoiseshell badges, and so forth. Uh, if yet, if anyone asks me how much is sufficient, I'll tell him, as exactly as Paul does in uh, the letter to, uh, in the first letter to, not Titus, but uh, Tim Timothy, yes where he writes the letter to Timothy 6 and 5, having food and raiment, let us be there with contempt. Anyone who wants more gets into real trouble, he says, for he wants more, falls into, uh, he uses the word the rapids, gets caught in the rapids, uh, into many foolish investments, and he lose everything anyway, he says. Many foolish and hurtful lots. So epithemia means desire for more than you have, and which has spoiled the faith of many and driven many out of the church, he says. Well, there's a familiar pattern, you see. Here we have it. If anyone asks me how much is sufficient, I'll tell him. As much as hunger and thirst and cold are demanding, as much as you need. As much as sufficed Epicurus, content with his little garden. As much as the household gods of Socrates had in the old days. Nature never di dictates one thing, and wisdom's another. Do I seem to be hemming you in with narrow precedence? Well then, copy our customs a bit. Take us... Take the sum that the Emperor Otho, the Emperor Mothi particularly dislikes, who is another, there were those three in a row, each one bought the Empire because he offered more money to the army than his predecessor, and the army then killed the predecessor and elected him, and then just went on this way uh, until it, it finally got to the, the Flavians, who were honest men. Uh, and the, the, way, the whole thing, Otho, the Emperor Otho, he deserved, reserved, uh, passed a law, reserving the first 14 rows in, in the games, just for people that had made 600,000 sesterces, you had to have that much money to sit in those rows. He did the wealth was the whole thing. He talks about that. Well, that's the way it was long ago, and it, it hasn't changed too much, has it? So he's talking about this, and boy, this, this strikes home. Why do you adorn yourself with that which has no life, and yet suffer the hungry and the needy and the naked, the sick and the afflicted, to pass by you and notice them not? Notice that. You don't afflict them. You don't go out of your way to hurt them or anything. You just don't notice them. That's the worst of all. Of course, we think of the, of the pearls and uh, the jewelry and the, and the ermine and the rest of the things that, at a fashionable party and outside, uh, people sleeping on the streets right outside of a fashionable party in Washington will say something like that. And why do they do it here? They don't frisk them, they don't even snub them. It's, this is the worst thing to be ignored, you see, there's bottom line. The, uh, so we can't be excused of, person, of, of uh, cruelty here, but this is worse. Uh, there are those who do not want to end poverty or war. And, well, that's, a, that's another story, there's some interesting things on that. But here anyway, uh, do we have anything particularly sage to say on this particular subject? No, well, I'll find out. Yes, respect for, for the things, uh, rather than respect for life, is what we're talking about here. 
And then, this is where the wealth comes from and what the ultimate effect is. Why do you build up your secret combinations to get gain? Combination is a corporation building agreements, but they're secret, and they get together and they'll pay off. As, uh, as uh, H.H. White says, the, uh, the people that, I think I have that here. It's, uh, oh, I put it, put it in the other book a moment. It's a good statement, but I won't read it. He says, they conceal the fact from us that they're operating, these corporations are operating a, a, co a cooperative, uh, more controlled and uh, more against uh, free enterprise than the, than the most rigid socialistic plan you could imagine, he says, is what we're in, within the corporation, is that what you'll find? It's you have to sing the, corp the, the company hymns and do things like that. Well, Ella White's book caused quite a sen sensation, called The Organization Man a few years ago. Maybe you haven't read that. We should assign things like this, we won't. Um, Yes, that cause, and what is the result? War, of course. What happens? What causes widows to mourn and orphans to mourn before the Lord? Of course, the killing of, of their husbands and, and their uh, children. Widows and orphans to mourn before, and also that or orphans should mourn before the Lord, and also the blood of their fathers and their husbands cry unto the Lord, the ground for vengeance upon them. This is the end result of war, of course, is that uh, families are not only broken up, but this is the, tra and it's a direct result of the preceding verse. The, uh, well, uh, this, this verse itself, excuse me, the secret combinations to get gain of lead columns. Now, here I could a story unfold. I spent months cruising around Europe in my own Jeep and accidentally finding much too much out that I should never have known what was, went on to the war and what was behind the whole thing. Uh, I tell you, it was, it was orchestrated and planned to an amazing extent. Not, you couldn't find it. Well, we won't go into that. No, let's go on. Well, what is... This is for us, and if we're guilty of these things, what's going to happen? What is our condition? Next verse, 41, the last verse, says what this is all pointing to. The sword hangeth over you. The sword of vengeance hangs over you. And the time soon cometh that he avenges the blood of the saints upon you, for he will not suffer their cause. So soon is going to be the same thing that happened to the Nephites and the others. The sword of vengeance is something up there that's going to fall down. It's going to come on us. The next chapters are those that don't believe, you see. Now, this is, the, this is the unbelievers. Do you have anything particularly sharp to say about this? What percent of us then uh, of the world uh, does not believe in God? And many of them, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, everywhere so far, the theme has been addressed to the Christian nation. And now you notice, here we have these hints. The next verse is this hint of extermination, period of extermination. Uh, we're living on the frail edge of an ecosystem right now that, as we know, is, is collapsing. Uh, and here it goes here. The earth shall be rolled together as a scroll. The elements shall melt with fervent, fervent heat. Well, there is a quietus. There is a real extermination period. And there have been such. This reads just like the description in that, that uh, issue of the geographic that I showed you here that on the subject of extermination. It was the fervent heat. Well, of course, it was a meter. It was a comet. Well, you call it a comet, but it was a, uh, yes, it was a, a meteor. A meteorite doesn't hit the earth, but a meteor does. And there have been some beautiful to wallop the earth from time to time. Well, not necessarily, but this is it. But the earth shall be rolled together as a scroll, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Well, there's nothing much you can do about conservation when you reach that stage, is there? You shall be brought to stand before the blood of the land. Uh, uh, this is not fear of death. Uh, no one can survive this sort of thing. This is what comes after. This will be recognized that there, it will recognize here that there is more to come. Uh, this is what we have to look forward to in the end. But so, this is to make us behave, and I hope we do. Will you no longer then deny their, see, because that, when that's open, when, when that curtain comes down, then you'll see the real stage. Then the whole thing will open out to us, and you'll see what it is. Will you deny then uh, that Christ is real? Can you behold the Lamb of God? Do you suppose that he shall dwell with him, conscious of your guilt? This is what we're going to, to shift to this, to this other world here. Uh, and do not all things, uh, all working up to this. Well, it can't be because you wouldn't, you wouldn't receive it, you see. You, you rejected it frantically. Notice here, he says here, the consciousness of your guilt. You'll know then that the only reason you weren't able to enjoy what you have a right, what you had a right to, is that you wouldn't have it, as far as that. You could, notice, you could be happy to dwell in the holy, with that holy being, but not when your souls are racked with the consciousness of your guilt. See, yourself, you throw yourself out of it. It doesn't have to be a particular hell, it doesn't even have to be a, a book is open to say, 
particular crimes you committed, you know perfectly well what the crimes were. It's your guilt that will accuse you and uh, that you have ever abused his laws. You will know that there will be no accuser will be necessary. You would be more miserable to dwell with God. You see, he's going to give you the best you want. You're, you're, getting, you're getting left off, uh, let off as easy as that as easy as ever. You prefer hell a thousand times uh, so that you won't have to have, so that's what you get if you want it. You know, with the kind of people you like and you want to be with. No, everyone's going to get the easiest possible sentence here. You'll be far more miserable than dwell with holy and just God, so they're not going to make you. You'll say, thank heaven for that. God, you're being very kind, not making me dwell here. It's like not being forced to take a certain class that's so far beyond you. You'd be utterly miserable. You wouldn't know what was going on there and so forth. And, uh, it's the same thing. We're adjusted to what we're willing to take and what we're able to take. There's justice here and there's mercy all the way here. No, he says, you must, we would much prefer to dwell with the damned souls in hell. They're your people. When you see your nakedness, you can imagine that embarrassment. You want anything to happen, the mountains to cover you, the rocks to fall on you and so forth. So, this is a reason, this is a very good reason, he says. You unbelieving turn unto the Lord. The whole trouble here is people just don't believe this. He says, there's not going to be any heaven, there's not going to be anything like that hereafter. And this is a point that uh, we come to now. But, <coughs> the unbelieving turn and, and believe, and perhaps she may be found spotless, pure and fair, and white, having been cleansed, it's still not too late. You see, notice having been cleansed, you're not clean now, but you can still do it. Having been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb on that great and last day. Again, I speak to you who deny the revelations of God, see. Now, this idea of gifts and so forth. Uh, we don't, we deny the gifts, we prefer office to gifts, you see. Brigham Young says prophecy is not a, an office, it's a gift. There are certain gifts, that, but we deny them, and yet they're the only things that are real. The office is temporal is temporary, it's official, a breath hath made them, uh, can make them, and a breath hath made. Remember, he uh, uh, burns the same, talking about the same thing. Anyone, anyone can be appointed to any office as far as that goes, offices of that nature. Men make them, we appoint them, they're, they're temporary, they're for a purpose. We say office is everything, and it was St. Augustine who decided that since we cannot control the spiritual gifts, we cannot control the spirit, we cannot control revelation, except unless by living righteously, and his generation didn't expect to live righteously. Remember his famous prayer, God give me chastity and confidence, but not yet. Well, that's the way they expected to live. He said, well, under these conditions, we're not going to get, we're not going to get revelations, and for much, the worst thing about them, they can't be controlled. And he was a Roman, and he thought everything had to be controlled. You have to crack down on everything. Ah, but office, that's different. Ceremony and office, they will take the place of revelations and gifts. He said, so they did. Everything then became ceremony and office. You, you can invent ceremonies, you can control ceremonies, you can stage a, person, uh, a, a certain date in the same way. You can control the power of office, you can uh, administer here and there, you can set up committees and the like, and have everything in control. You can't do that with the spiritual gifts and the spirit, you see. So that took the place, and, and uh, we are prone today to respect office, to reverence office, simply in itself or nothing else. So you deny the revelations, and they deny the gifts, and here are the great gifts, you notice what they're done with. Revelations, prophecies, healing, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues. Those are the, the greatest gifts. He that denieth these things knoweth not the gospel of Christ. He has not read the scriptures. Uh, you know, Smith uh, says everything you teach must be square, must square with the scripture, if you have them. And so, I will show you a God of miracles. The man, and because the fall of man came, then he talks, he sums up, the atonement here. Because of the fall of man came Jesus Christ, even the Father and the Son, and because of Jesus Christ came the redemption of man. And he is brought back into the presence of God. That's what atonement means, that one brought back into the presence of. Are brought back into the presence of God, wherewith all men are deemed, because the death of Christ bringeth to pass resurrection, which bringeth to pass redemption from an endless sleep. Now, notice the Book of Mormon recognizes, and this is recognized earlier by Nephi, that the entropy as the real thing, you see. It would be an endless sleep if there wasn't somebody who knew more about it. Nature is in person, lets you do anything you want as far as that goes. But uh, the expression that, uh, that Alma uses, we would die to rot and disappear and rise no more in the normal, in the normal order of things. That's what nature would have us do, and that's true. They frankly admit it, and he admits it here. Their redemption from an endless sleep, I think, Catullus' famous ode here, Una Nox 
perpetua dormienda, one perpetual night of endless sleep is all that awaits anybody here. But that's not so, because there's somebody who's able to control that, somebody who knows more. I mean, if nature is dumb and blind and has no particular preferences for this, that, or the other, why can't the power of mind control it? It's not going to make any objection as long as you, you follow whatever the laws or principles are built into the, the structure of these things. The point is that there's someone who's there who is able to overcome. And this is a very real thing, because we see it all around us, the power of, of entropy is reduced all the time. This is what Buckminster Fuller wrote about. He called it syntropy and so forth. The Russians are especially intrigued by this, especially uh, uh, one called uh, yes, Kozera. He says, look, this is silly to say, because everywhere you look, you see things are being formed, put together. Somebody's doing something, he says, and we don't know anything about it. Well, we've got to get on to the Jared. I said, oh, well, incidentally, here are these things. These are the ones of, uh, this is Brother Kimball's talk, and it's from our own the Xerox department, causing mass when they're 20 cents apiece. Too much, but that's the world we live in. We've just been talking about that.